All right, um, so I'll just I'll just start. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you coming in here virtually. I hope everyone's doing OK out there. Um, you have arrived at our very first WGF Library script breakdown session. Yay! Um, I am Lauren O'Connor, your co-host for this event, and joining me is my colleague Javier Barrios, and we are script librarians at the Writers Guild Foundation Library. Yeah, and um, and hopefully you're here because you're a library fan or a user, um, you know. But if you've never been to the library, uh, just know that we have a massive collection of uh, TV and film scripts, produced materials, and during non-pandemic times, um, we do provide access to to scripts in person in the WJ building uh, here in Los Angeles. Um, also, um, you know, right now, even though we are closed, um, we we can still help you with uh, with like script related questions. So if you poke around our website, wgfoundation.org, and you see something, some, something that preferably something that's digital so we can have access to it and you want to know something about it, let us know and then just email us and we're happy to help. Now, um, you might be wondering, um, what is the WGF Library Script Breakdown? Um, and then Lauren will explain yeah. it. Uh, this is a new series in which Javier and I will sit down virtually with a writer, producer, showrunner, and we will talk at length about a script that they wrote. Um, these sessions are for anybody out there at any level who loves scripts and loves reading scripts to learn. Think of it kind of like reading a script, but with commentary from the writer th themselves. Right. And so for our first session, we are super happy, super thrilled to have Elena uh, Smith uh, she's the creator and showrunner of Apple TV Plus series uh, Dickinson. Um, so welcome. Um, well, we're going to be focusing, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, Dickinson season two, a particular episode. Uh, episode six is called Split the Lark. It's episode um, eight, right? Oh, episode sorry, eight. Say no. oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, if you're, episode six. Yeah, oh. yeah, right, right, yeah, so, right. <laughs> um, if you're not caught up on Dickinson, um, you know, maybe get caught up, but even if you're not there, uh, this still should be very informative, and uh, especially from a TV writing and formatting uh, standpoint. Um, so just like any other session we do, Javier and I are going to kick us off with some contextual questions, and our talk on Split the Lark is going to be split in half. Um, for the second half here, we're going to move into actually having script pages on screen, and we will talk about them in detail. Um, and don't worry if while we're talking about the script, you miss something. Um, we're actually going to post the script um, on our website after um, after the talk, so you can read it and catch up on anything you might have uh, that might have whizzed by you. Um, so now there's one more thing. Um, if at any point you who are watching this um, have a question, feel free to submit it in that Q&A. Uh, there's like a Q&A option in your little Zoom bar there. Um, fair warning, while moderating virtually, it's very hard for us to mitigate your questions and our questions. But if something really apropos comes up, we'll try to get to it um, and ask as many questions as you want. Um, so with all of that said, um, thank you so much, Elena, for yes, being here. Thank you. Um, this is awesome. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and um, just kind of get us started here. Um, I want to talk about um, your background as a playwright and then segueing into writing for television. Um, and I specifically want to know how you went about learning kind of the ins and outs of writing for TV. Yeah, um, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, I started out as a playwright. I went to Yale Drama School and graduated in 2006 and then lived in um, New York for a number of years and was just trying to get my plays produced, sometimes self-producing them, um, having a couple plays produced like off-Broadway. Um, and you know, I guess playwriting really was my first love because I love language and writing for great actors to give great performances. Um, and I think, you know, it took me a little bit longer to, and I'm still learning uh, how to work with cameras, um, which is like the main difference that I see, you know, between, between theater and um, TV and film. But I guess the thing that happened is that in the time um, 
in like the decade or so after I graduated from drama school, television really radically changed um, and it's still changing. But, you know, thanks to, um, I guess, first the advent of premium cable and then now streaming platforms, there's so much more space that's been opened up in TV for um, experimental, auteur driven, uh, uh, like niche forms of storytelling. Um, maybe you might say also more space for theatrical forms of storytelling. Um, and certainly I don't think there's any doubt that a show like Dickinson could not have existed uh, before, you know, basically when it, when it aired. Um, and, you know, um, that has, and, and many people that I used to do theater with are involved in the making of Dickinson. Um, from our costume designer who was a classmate of mine from drama school and um, to many of the actors that we've cast out of the New York theater world and um, on and on, there's there's many connections. So I still feel that like the theater world is where my roots are and where I found my artistic voice. Um, but then uh, coming into TV, it was sort of like looking for the spaces where I could um, be myself and say the things that I wanted to say uh, and, and learning, you know, how to make TV, which involves like learning how to be on set and learning that, you know, if you write a scene that's 10 pages of dialogue sitting around a dinner table, that's <laughs> really complicated to shoot. Whereas in a play, it would be pretty easy to stage. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it was sort of like, I think, um, an evolution of myself as an artist, meeting an evolution of like the television medium and industry. And I got lucky and, and, and where they intersected, I was able to make Dickinson. Well, it sounds like, yeah, you, you knew the opportunity, you know, you, you saw it. I mean, that gave me goosebumps when you said you brought back, you know, some of the people you used to work with. That's, mm. that's amazing. Um, so, um, you know, we know that you used the library before. Um, can you talk about like what scripts you may recall reading there? Um, you know, like what, what did it something move you when you were there? You know, like any particular script that you remember reading there? Uh, wow. <laughs> it wasn't, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, it, you know, I think, I think I can't remember which scripts I read specifically in the library, but I do think that, you know, it's so important to read scripts and the library is such a great resource for, um, you know, learning what a, a, a script looks like on the page. And particularly, I think reading pilot scripts can be really useful if you are trying to write a pilot. I mean, one of the ways that the industry has changed, one of the many ways that the industry has changed, even in the short term time that I've been involved in it, um, is, is, you know, that it used to be the case that you would write a spec script of an existing show uh, to show how your voice would reflect, you know, the voice of the showrunner. But I think now the emphasis is really on people writing original pilots, right. um, which is a much more complicated and difficult undertaking um, because in a pilot, you're laying the groundwork for an entire world of a show. Um, but, you know, it's so wonderful to be able to look at, you know, whatever, whatever the relevant pilots are of the genre that you're exploring and look at how like the right. people that successfully did it, um, you know, crammed that amount of story and exposition into, into yeah. a compelling, you know, half hour or hour of TV. Right. And, and uh, speaking of that, was there, was when you were preparing the series, did you, was there anything in particular that you saw or that you read that you wanted to say, oh, this is kind of what I want to do? Yeah, um, it's funny, actually, uh, some, so as far as TV goes, uh, it, and it's sort of about the time in which I was working on the pilot of Dickinson, which was basically 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, but I was definitely inspired by um, Girls and Transparent mm -hmm. as um, being these shows that uh, showed female and queer characters in very visceral, sometimes unpleasant ways. And I thought, what would it be like if you did that, but you did it in the 19th century? Um, and I also remember Atlanta was on at the time and that, you know, Atlanta had, had taken a page out of the sort of like Louis storybook of, of a kind of subjective 
emotional half hour dramedy um, and uh, just all the texture and atmosphere of that. Uh, and I definitely also was um, always, I, I mean, you know, David Gordon Green directed the pilot of Dickinson and, and um, a number of people that were his collaborators came into the mix and still are part of the world of Dickinson, like our DP and our music supervisor and editors and, um, I was just a humongous fan of Eastbound and Down. And I knew that like, it probably wouldn't really make sense why I would say that like this version of Emily Dickinson was a little bit like Kenny Powers, but um, <laughs> there there was something there because, you know, yeah. she was yeah. convinced of her own greatness and not letting anybody stop her. Um, and uh, then another script that really unlocked the tone for me of Dickinson was, um, uh, the Royal Tenenbaums, yeah. um, which I read sort of right before I finally cracked like the version of the pilot that I felt good about. Um, and I think it was really useful for me because there's a certain timelessness to it where you don't really know, there, there's no specific year necessarily when that um, show is taking place, or sorry, when that film is taking place, but there's such a specificity to the characters and there's this um, family of codependent aristocrats that uh, felt a lot like the Dickinson family. Well, I think I think when you mention all those, I can totally see it. Right? It's like when M Knight said that that like Sixth Sense was a cross between Ordinary People and Carrie. <laughs> it totally yeah. makes sense. <laughs> so <Yeah>. same here. <laughs> Um, so in your series, uh, can you talk a little bit about like how you meld, you know, history and then present day, you know, like dialogue and mannerisms and so forth. And how, how did you like come up with that tone? Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, Dickinson is a show that uses the past to look at the present and uses the present to look at the past, right? And um, it's in, in, in some ways it's like a comedy of manners about how insane the 19th century was. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also about showing how our current world is made of the 19th century and in many ways obeys the same rules and expectations that were operative then. And so look how insane our world is today. Right. Um, and I suppose it's a really strange and delicate balance with the tone. Um, in a way, I guess you could say there's a sort of a rule, which is that when a character is operating according to the social expectations of the 19th century, they will speak more recognizably, period. Mm. Um, and when they are hitting against those expectations, they will speak more the way we speak today. And obviously we also have our soundtrack, which is constantly operating as this like direct line of access into Emily's contemporary consciousness that's like bursting against the seams of her corset and all of the social expectations of the 19th century that are hemming her in as a as a young female queer artist. Wow. Um, and I suppose, you know, you could theoretically have done this with any historical figure. I think the way the reason it it perhaps is apt with Dickinson is that she wasn't understood in her own time. She wasn't appreciated in her own time. Um, and, you know, one thing I think people were surprised at first saying, like, why would there be a comedy about Emily Dickinson? But really, when you spend time with her work, you see that she was absolutely hilarious. Like her work is really drenched in irony. She has a very like edgy sense of humor. Um, so for both of those reasons, and I suppose look, she was a poet, she experimented with language. She did things with language that no one had ever seen before. And she did them in incredibly tight, confined little spaces. Um, and that's uh, why I guess, you know, I feel like the show takes a page out of the spirit of Emily Dickinson. Um, 
Right. But it is it is definitely up to something bigger than just being a biography of Emily Dickinson. It is definitely, mm -hmm. you know, I want to use the 19th century as a filter or code with which we can see our world today. Yeah. It's a it's a stylized it's a stylized picture of the present. Right. You know, I really, I, ha I say this over, I really have no interest in telling anybody what the past was like. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in telling people what the present was like. And there are things, there are things that I can reveal about the present by setting this show in the past that I could not possibly reveal if it was just a poet in Massachusetts in the year 2020. Right. Even though we always are finding these, like, I didn't know that we would all be trapped inside in the year 2020, <laughs> like, and that it would become more and more like Emily Dickinson's world. But yeah. Um, and then, okay, so we've kind of talked about like big picture, how you establish the tone. Um, mm -hmm. Is is there um, kind of a way that you approach each particular episode? Um, you know, maybe with your writer's room, how you kind of conceive um, each individual chapter? Yeah, so um, this is a very predetermined writer's room. Um, I, 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 I come into the room be, being like, this is, you know, this is the shape of the season. These are poems I want to use. The, this is the theme of the season. This is the basic arc. These are the, you know, I, we know there's 10 episodes. Like, there's always much more then can be crammed in. And so the challenge is cramming it all in. Um, but the part of the reason why I have so much information um, from the beginning is, is in a way is because of the way that the show is constructed as a kind of collage out of all these found sources. And I sort of have more uh, scraps of inspiration than I know what to do with because there is the Dickinson biography and everything that I've found that I think is interesting mm -hmm. out of that. There's all her poems and I'm always keeping lists of, you know, my favorite phrases and words and thinking like, that's a good one for an episode or that could be dialogue or that's an image that we could just have in the show. Um, and, uh, and, and then even beyond that, sort of like the 19th century literary milieu, who are the celebrity cameos that I really want us to meet, who are the great, the other great writers, um, who are usually being compared to Emily in this ironic sense that they were appreciated in their own time and she was not. Um, but then uh, I suppose also I could be inspired just by a, a 19th century activity um, you know, something, something that I just really would never yeah, otherwise yeah. get the opportunity to see. I mean, um, uh, it, like, you know, just, I'll just, I'll just say in, in season three, which we're in production on now, there's a maple sugaring party. And that was like, you know, my personal fantasy. I want to go to a maple sugaring party. <laughs> um, so, so there's, there's all these different things. And I, I kind of come into the writer's room with like, a whole bunch of puzzle pieces and mm -hmm. scraps. And maybe it is sort of like we then make a quilt, you know, and, and say, how do they all go together? But it, it's like an episode can start with any of those things. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we started with, um, you know, something that wasn't a poem and then we had a, 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 an important event that we knew was gonna happen. Sometimes we have to go after the fact and like dig to find the right title for the episode. And, you know, she's not always writing the poem um, that is the title of the episode in the episode. Right. Sometimes she is, sometimes she's not. Mm -hmm. um, in season two, in season two, Emily was struggling with writer's block. So there was also a sort of a long phase of the season where she's not even really writing any poems mm -hmm. because her, beautiful creativity has been kind of stopped by all the self-consciousness brought on by the pursuit of fame. Mm. Got it. Um, okay, I, I have a, my next question is, it segues perfectly, like how you, um, how you came up with this episode, but while I have you here, I just realized mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite Emily Dickinson poem? Oh, <laughs> Oh, I mean, I have so many and for so many different reasons. And there's ones that like, 
you know, haven't found their way into this show yet that, 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 I mean, they're just all so good. Like she's mm-hmm. such a good yeah. writer and yeah. there's just beautiful phrases in, and, you know, in, in ones that, um, so I, I don't know. I don't, I really don't have an answer to this because it's like, I can't pick one, but I will say that, um, there's a poem, there's a poem that probably will never make it into the show that I love, which is called, uh, the grass so little has to do. And, um, I think that it's, it's all about, you know, the speaker of the poem is looking at just a field of grass and, and envying it for the fact that all it has to do is just blow in the wind. (laughs) And, uh, I think as a, as a, as a showrunner and mother of um, toddler twins, that has been an enviable position for me. And I would like to be a grass lying out. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna write a poem about my cat then. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that's all he does. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> all right, that little aside aside, um, let's talk about uh, Split the Lark and um, how you came up with this episode and how it sort of Um, fits thematically in what you were trying to accomplish this season. Ah, all right. Well, I'm so happy to be talking about this episode. And um, I really feel proud of this episode in a way that stands out from all the other episodes of Dickinson, in in part because I I also think this is an episode that could be viewed on its own as as like a short film and you, you could get a lot out of it and enjoy it, right? And I also think probably, I mean, it's beautiful and all the elements are beautiful, but I also treasure it because I was pushing um, boundaries of storytelling in ways that were a little bit more experimental perhaps than, than I, than, than maybe other episodes have sustained. And maybe it was like, we went right up to the edge of like, is this okay? Can we do this in a, in a TV episode? And, and I was so, um, proud of the way that this team of artists came together to to make this thing happen. So to back up, I guess, first of all, Split the Lark, I mean, that could be an answer to what is my favorite poem. It's Mm -hmm. a stunning, strange poem that um, is all about the speaker of the poem declaring her faithfulness to a lover and saying, could you ever doubt that I love you? If you doubt me, cut me open like a bird and you'll and and you'll find if like if you cut a bird open, you would find the bird's song rolled up on like in silver rolls of of music, which I don't know if that is has something to do with like a player piano having like rolls of music inside Mm -hmm. of it or, or something. But the idea that, first of all, that a jealous lover would would want to cut open the heart of, of someone to, to prove that, that their love was real. When of course, if you did that, you would kill your lover. Um, I mean, you know, this is, this is like psychological terror and tension inside of this poem that is unbelievable to me. And, um, and season two was all about um, creating a, a, a kind of shady, shadowy, um, psychological, erotic thriller that is going on between Emily, Sue and Sam, and which in certain ways really comes to a head at this opera. Um, okay, then additionally, we had, um, I mean, this is a season about fame. And opera was at the time like the latest trend. Um, And there were Americans who went abroad to Europe and studied opera with the European masters and, um, uh, and, and came back and were the celebrities of, of their day. One of the most famous was this woman, Jenny Lind, who, um, it was a was a very famous singer and and like there was something called lindomania where people were you know following her on tour like they would today with like taylor swift um and emily did see jenny lind perform and she wrote something afterwards where she said uh like i don't know if it was her her singing or her that held the fascination so this this was a, a little keyhole into emily's sort of suspicion of celebrity culture, but also like fascination with it. And um, this idea that like the artist and her persona could really overtake the art itself. Um, Kind of like famous for being famous, what we would say today. Um, And I think also, you know, I knew that I had this amazing team of, of like 
both theater and film artists and, and a show that's so centered on music and all the connections between poetry and music. And so I wanted to basically make like a bottle episode that takes place at the opera where we would really get to experience um, a, a full opera. There, there's also a reference, Emily does reference opera a couple times in her, um, in her poems. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the Dickinsons ever took an actual trip to the opera, but um, they did see Jenny Lynn sing and she uses the phrase opera. So anyway, like uh, this is just uh, to go into real detail about the kind of like collaginess of this, right? And and mm -hmm. even something as small as like, well, we'll get there. But when when Ella then sings the song Split the Lark that we made with our composers, into a new song for her to sing. Um, we created in the sound design, like bird feathers flapping. That's meant to be like the beating of Emily's heart. Um, and that comes from Split the Lark, right? So we're really doing like a very close textual reading of the poetry and the literary critiques around it. Um, at, at, at all moments and sort of choosing La Traviata as the opera, both because that was one of, that was an opera that existed in 1859 when our show takes place. There actually aren't that many because it was still so new, mm -hmm. but also La Traviata being about, um, you know, a courtesan who uh, is, is a seductress, right? Which is kind of what, what Sue is really being in the season, but what she has kind of gaslit Emily into thinking that she is is being to Sam Bowles. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna give you a second to sort of catch your breath um, and I'll, I'm gonna uh, do a recap of this episode for everyone before we really, really dive into the script. Um, so basically, um, if you've watched it and you kind of like, I don't know how you could forget it, but um, if, if you need a refresher, uh, the Dickinsons in Split the Lark attend the opera where they all watch La Traviata from different locations in the theater, kind of coupled off. You have Mr. and Mrs. Dickinson, Austin and Sue, Lavinia and Ship. Then Emily ends up excitedly sitting in a box with Sam. Um, where things don't go so well. Um, but we also get to see how each of the characters kind of connects or doesn't connect with the opera. Right. Um, I think Javier had another question. Oh, no, no, no. Um, so, so I mean, um, well, should we bring the script up? No, no, oh, let, oh, no, no. ask this one and then we'll dive in, I think. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, th no, I think you answered it. My, my, my only question was like, you know, like, like where you started with the idea for the script, but I think I think we've we've, we've moved on from that. Well, in terms of I think, in terms of when you sat down um, to write, where was the first place you started with the script, or when you when you outlined it, or conceived yeah, of it? Yeah, I I think that um I mean it's okay. So I I wrote this script like two years ago now, so I have to I have to re yeah. rewind a little bit, but. Look, I knew one thing that was going to be special about this episode was that it was all going to take place in the opera house and that it was going to be essentially just our our series regulars. It was going to be just our Dickinson family. And um, and so I I, you know, was was probably beginning by thinking through what are each of our beloved Dickinson family members going to be doing on this night at the opera. Um, and that was probably a beginning. And then and then also um, thinking about the sort of shift in the episode between when Emily goes backstage um, and what she was gonna discover there back backstage. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, we also had done a huge amount of research about like opera at the time. And we came up with the character Adelaide out of a sort of amalgamation of, um, real examples of, of again, like American singers who went to Europe and studied opera and then came back and became big celebrities mm -hmm. there. Got it. Um, and, you know, Emily, in, in each episode of season two, Emily has a different um, kind of dialectic experience of fame or discourse with somebody about fame. So, um, you know, her discussion with Olmsted gives her one insight and, and, you know, there's other examples, but I think I knew that Adelaide was really going to have this, this very um, bleak perspective on fame, which is that it's fully like an emptied out experience. Um, right. yeah. 
Got it. Okay. Well, now let's, we're right at the half hour mark. Let's dive on into the script. Yes. Cue the pages, Kat. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so we're obviously going to start on page one here. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this teaser um, and and the impetus to, to start with, we're here. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, I, mean, right. <laughs> I mean, so I have the incredible honor of writing for, you know, some of these <laughs> best actors who have their all all their own unique strengths and I think that you know I just thought that uh Jane Krakowski doing opera would be hilarious um <laughs> and I I guess the thing actually I mean the most interesting sort of little tidbit I can share about this is that it really came down to the editing because what actually makes this moment funny is that the main title smash cuts her off while she's still right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that and that's just like a small nuance, but like at first it wasn't cut that way. And and you know, or you could imagine that that somebody might say, well, let's try that she goes, we're here. And then there's like an awkward silence afterwards. But I I, uh, I knew okay. always that it had to be like we're here, you know. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that's very fit. Like smash that that's yeah. yeah, I could see. That was a good choice. <laughs> Um, so I also had a little question just about um, describing historical things like a 19th century opera house and kind of making it accessible to a reader. Um, what was sort of your approach to um, description? Or what is your approach to description, you know, kind of across across scripts? Well, I mean, that's interesting. Like, obviously, when I wrote this script, I didn't know yet what the location would be. And I mean, the location that we ultimately got, like, blew my mind beyond anything. But I guess I did, I did think we would be in a kind of jewel box theater type space, which is something that I'm familiar with, because I did plays for so long. Um, and that excitement of like a night at the theater or a night at the opera is what I was really trying to capture. And I think also um, making it really clear that like this was gonna be an episode where we kicked all the costumes like up to 11. Um, <laughs> and, and so that, those would be the things I was emphasizing. Got it. Um, okay, Kat, let's jump to page three um, where the Dickinsons are kind of getting settled um, into the opera here. Um, and we have Lavinia talking about Adelaide. Um, and you, you sort of, you mentioned that um, she's kind of based on Jenny Lind. Uh, uh, not really. I mean, she's actually based on, Jenny Lind is, is um, Jenny Lind was the person who Emily actually saw sing. Got it. Um, so I would say that perhaps maybe more the conversation Emily ultimately has with Adelaide bears some um, like inspiration in that. But she was based on a couple different examples of opera stars that we found in this book about the history of the American opera, none of whom were named Adelaide. I don't remember what they were what they were named. Right. Um, yeah. Adelaide May sounds like an opera star, though. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, was, I was just kind of curious. Yeah, I mean that that answers my question because it's I I like kind of the little bit of exposition here. I, I mean, she even even down to the parenthetical that says no at all. I mean, this was a sort of unusual thing for us because like Adelaide May is not like Thoreau or yeah. Louisa. Right, right. She's she's not real, and that's actually unusual for Dickinson. Mm -hmm. um, but thematically, it fits with what is being explored in this episode, which is that when somebody is hugely famous, it's not their real self that anyone is ex is getting to ex encounter anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So the idea that Adelaide is a bit of a, a shadow figure, um, we don't really know who she really is, um, is actually fitting. But again, not typical for us because typically we are having people who were really there and had some tangential relationship like you know even like abby abaya jane humphreys like those are all real people from emily's biography yeah. like i'm always trying to have things be real yeah. but adelaide is actually a uh journey into fancifulness that is unusual for the show got it got it cool so um now i think we're going to move going to page six 
And um, so, yeah, so I love this part. So basically, like uh, one question I had is that, you know, when people are whispering uh, here about uh, Sam and Emily, first of all here, you know, Emily's super excited to be sitting in a box with Sam and Sam is not so excited about it. But uh, they're, they're, they're whispering, they're gossiping. And in the script, uh, you don't have uh, in, a, a line, but in the production, you know, somebody says, oh, she's the new one and so forth. And was that like, um, was that something that you found you should do once it was produced or? or yeah, you... that was something that we added in ADR. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that good. makes sense. And um, also on this page, um, the word lark, Right. in Sam's uh, dialogue, I think Sam says it right. Um, you have one definition for it here. And then at the end of the episode, uh, you have an, an, an use Lark again. Um, and you have another definition for that word uh, being used. And do you did you have what was your intention with that? Did you have any intention with by doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's to start planting it's, it's like we're, it's like the words are being planted in Emily's head because what's ultimately going to happen is that she's going to reconnect with her own artistic spark um, by hearing Sue, well, she's here, sorry, it's actually, Adelaide is singing and Emily feels like she's connecting with the true spirit of Sue and her love for Sue. And in that moment, she's also hearing a poem. Um, so yeah, but I mean, I think it's also just me being playful with. Yeah, with the <laughs> I um, look, yeah, I looked up both definitions. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I feel like it's you know what's interesting this episode and this whole season really, but particularly this this episode. Like the, another writer that it owes just as much to as Emily Dickinson is Patricia Highsmith. And I was really thinking about the talented Mr. Ripley and Strangers on a Train mm -hmm. and the kind of tortured um, psychological narrative that that Patricia Highsmith um, is such a master of, which I feel is often about um, a somebody who is deeply closeted um, and who they're, I mean, what's, what's so scary about Patricia Highsmith is that they're it is in a time when there's no language for um, homosexuality. So it's all sort of embedded and, and withdrawn into these like motives that are so powerful, but never seem to be fully explicated in the characters. Um, but you know, what's, what's going on here in this scene when Emily is sitting with Sam because Sue has told Emily and Sam to sit with each other you know, the first time that someone is watching season two through, and I'm just going to go ahead and spoil all of this. <laughs> the first time someone's watching it through, like, I mean, there's just, there's just many, many interpretations of the motives and the feelings that are available. And it, it, I almost, I, I, I guess it's just like, there's layers and layers and layers to what's going yeah. on. And we've got Emily and Sam sitting in the box together and Sue watching them through her opera glasses. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ev what everybody does in this episode is actually built on like layers of lies. Um, and so, but actually Emily is blind to all of that and Emily, Poor Emily is kind of being basically gaslit by everyone around her, um, okay. you know, but anyway, so, yeah. Yeah, she's pure and innocent in a way, you know, she doesn't have to follow the same rules. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're going to uh, page 8A. Um, there you and go. So, oh, yeah, so here... Um, Oh well, yeah, so this is this is something interesting. Uh, so you have a lot of two two person scenes in the, in the, you know in this episode, and can you talk a little bit about like why you like? I mean, obviously it's the opera, but is there a reason why you have a lot of two person scenes, and does it have anything to do with your days as a playwright? Hmm. Well, I think it has to do with the structure of this season, and that you know, like I mean, in this case, like Lavinia and Lavinia's whole arc in season two is about her and ship mm -hmm. um and so and mr and mrs dickinson are also kind of paired off in mm -hmm. in season two because um they're e experiencing life as empty nesters 
uh, even though actually none of their children have left home. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, um, you know, Mrs. Dickinson wants to like reinvigorate their romantic relationship. And Mr. Dickinson is too distracted by his financial worries to really like lock in with her. Um, but yeah, I suppose in the context of this episode, everyone's on a date. So uh, that's, that's why. Yeah. Right. Um, and all, oh, also um, on this page, uh, the future quoting, you know, the, the, so um, is this, uh, is this your own made up term? And, um, and, and if so, like, how do you, how do you, how do you explain, when do you use it? If you use okay, it? Okay, so I will say, so future quoting, yes, that I think, you know, I made that up or we made that up in the writer's room. This is a, this is a place where I will admit that I, um, my writer's room uh, was was rebellious and <laughs> rules that I would typically set for the show. Um, and I think there was a cohort of writers that convinced me that this was hilarious and that it had to go into uh, to this episode. <laughs> and and I, I let them beat me in this case, um, even though it truly breaks all the rules of our show and makes no sense. Um, but... <laughs> I guess the only the only way that it that it works in terms I mean I guess I suppose if going by the actual rules of Dickinson it's just a coincidence that Lavinia happens to say the exact dialogue that Richard Gere will one day say in the right. book. Um, but as far as like the joke of it for the audience it's not just about a random reference it's about the fact that La Traviata, which is the opera that they go see in Pretty Woman and is about a prostitute. And um, it's always like, this is a moment of such consummate mansplaining that happens in Pretty Woman where, you know, Julia Roberts is just like learning so much, you know, and in this, and in this, you know, world, we've, we've flipped that script and it's Lavinia who's, um, you know, wanting to show off her intellectual abilities to ship. And she's actually sort of alienating him because he's starting to feel like he's never going to uh, be good enough for her because he didn't graduate from college. So. Fascinating. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so now we'll sort of jump ahead. Um, I think the next example we wanted to look at was page 11. Um so we end up here um, in the box with Emily and Sam and Sam basically tells Emily that this letter that she wrote to his wife um, about how wonderful he is and how great he makes her feel. Um, he tells her that it really upset his wife and that it was inappropriate and Emily responds with um, it's how I feel. Um, and hold on. Um, I'd, I'd just like to talk about um, kind of your writing of this scene and your um your inspiration when you sat down to write it um and i also i'll save that let's talk let's talk about writing this scene well okay so this is so as i um that you know connected to everything i was saying before about the the layers of truth and lies that are in this scene right and um i remember it was funny i you know, I, I had access to these episodes once they were posted and, and I was watching them um, with my parents in the pandemic because I was stuck uh, at home with them for a long time. But um, uh, but um, uh, I remember my parents watched this episode and they were like, oh my gosh, we, th we thought Sam was such a jerk, but he, he really is great. And like, oh, the old Sue is back. Like, we're so happy. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I knew that, you know, that the that the story was working because um okay, so so let's 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 pick apart like what's the real truth of what's happening here. The truth of what's happening here is that Sue uh you know has so repressed her love of Emily that she's become this like dysfunctional zombie version of herself. She has sublimated all of her desire for Emily into this weird triangle that she's concocted with Sam Bowles. Um, she's, you know, trying to push Emily both to publish with Sam because it will benefit, um, you know, Sue's social ambitions, but more importantly, because it because Sue can't handle all of the emotion that comes at her every single time Emily writes her a poem. And um, and so in this crazy act of denial, Sue is pretending that what she really wants is for Emily to fall in love with Sam and and publish her poems with him. Meanwhile, 
as we won't find out till two episodes later than this, Sue is the one having an affair with Sam. Um, uh, again, both out of this sort of, you know, extreme self hatred and self denial, um, as and 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 this kind of like um, nihilistic, I think. Sub subsequent to her miscarriage. I mean, whatever, I don't have to unpack all of it. But so, so Sue, so, so Sue has pushed Sue, Sam and Emily together. Sam is interested in publishing Emily's poems and is having an affair with Sue. So he's not actually trying to sleep with Emily or whatever. Maybe he just flirts with everybody, but like he, he, you know, he's, he was um, trying to take a sort of progressive interest in her poems uh, and and now it's thanks to Sue, he has attracted her 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 like sexual interest as well because Emily sort of can't tell the difference between a professional and a personal interest. And also she's been cut off so deeply by Sue that she's kind of out here flailing, just looking for somebody to to catch her. Um, but what's interesting is that Emily has actually written a letter to Mary, who is Sam's wife and Sue's friend from childhood, all of which is true. Um, and Emily did write these pretty crazy letters to Mary <laughs> where she went way overboard in describing how wonderful it is every time Sam Bowles comes to visit. Meanwhile, Mary's at home with like their 10 kids. And it's just, I don't know, it's just weird. It's just yeah. interesting and strange. And um. So Sam is angry because Mary got this letter and now thinks Sam is having an affair, which he is. It's just that it's with Sue and not with Emily. And he's also pissed because Sue has pushed them into the box together. Um, and, you know, like it's all kind of Sam likes things when he can control them. And it's all getting a little bit out of his control right now. So unfortunately, all of this kind of lands on Emily when he starts, you know, just blaming her for being all over the place with her emotions and saying, you know, this was never about us. There was, it was always just me trying to help you with your work, which, you know, there's a plausible deniability to it, at least. I, I, I don't know whether Sam meant for Emily to fall in love with him or not, but it's not convenient for him right now. So right. <laughs> but what's 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 amazing is that like, you know, when the scene is going on, we can you can have the reaction that my parents had, which is like, oh my god, he's such a good guy. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good point. Um, the other thing I just well, this is more just just something to note for people who are watching. Um it's it's kind of unique formatting there where you have them kind of talking over each other with the slashes i always see that as more as actually more of a a playwriting thing um and i just think it's cool that you incorporated that um into the cool. script um so now um we're gonna jump let's jump to page 13. cool um and a little bit if you could scroll just a tiny bit um yep keep going keep going keep going um, this, okay, so when we're here in, um, in the opera house, actually watching the opera, um, I can't tell you the amount of emails we get about, hey, I'm writing this script, um, and it's, it takes place at a wrestling match, and I want to know how to cut between what's happening in this wrestling match and what's happening in the stands. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is another thing I, you know, I don't necessarily have a question here, but um, I just want to, you know, kind of call attention to um, the way you've um, formatted this, right. like the, Separated. you know, it's like you see Sam's box and uh, Sue and Austin's box, Lavinia and Ship. Um, and I don't know. Um, yeah. Do and we always tell people, sorry, we always tell people there's so many different ways to do it. Just look at a few scripts. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, well, I mean, in, in, in the broadest sense, in terms of script writing, I really just feel like there actually aren't rules. And what you have to do is, is you almost have to just imagine one person that you're trying to tell this to and convey it in as clear of a manner as possible. Um, and just say, you know, what is it that you want to see on the screen? Mm -hmm. um, but in order to write this, first of all, my writer's room, um, we actually went and saw La Traviata at the LA Opera House, which was very fun. Um, and so I, I, had, I had it in my head and I had um, evaluated and made 
clear to myself this one stretch of the opera that we were going to see. So this was, in some sense, this was scored to a real bit of La Traviata. And ultimately we had a group of actual opera singers and an opera director on the stage performing this piece of the opera. And then, you know, the editing and the sound design was all scripted and sculpted around that as well, which is incredibly challenging. Um, and, you know, when I was writing this, I did not necessarily know at all how, um, how, how that was gonna be mechanically pulled off by the team. And that's why it's just such a testament to like the levels of collaboration and, and, and you know, everyone bringing their own um, area of expertise to how you pull something like this off. But I guess I'm just trying to create a map, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, so it's, it's it, I think I think the key is that like, I sort of knew what they were actually watching yep. and having a clock in my head of like real time mm -hmm. and how, 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 how long it would take to go to these and how the action on the stage could be playing out as one, you know, con consecutive stretch. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Um, so let's uh, let's jump to the, the pivotal moment, um, which happens on um, page 16, um, where Adelaide is singing and um, and then, uh, you know, Emily sort of has this uh, this crazy vision. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I, yeah, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit, because this is kind of, I mean, for me, when I watch the episode, this is definitely like the moment. Um, can you talk about writing this and, and, and um, how you sort of conceived of this moment? Well, um, I think that um, one thing, I, I actually can't, you know, I can't remember the exact order of when when we decided that it would really be Ella singing because there was definitely also a world where it could have been Haley singing because it is her own artistic voice it is Emily's own artistic voice that she is connecting to but I suppose ultimately the way it's done she is um she is connecting uh to to the muse of um of Sue Mm -hmm. um and mm -hmm. so um sorry somebody just asked it's not sue in the script i think it is i think if we go yeah, down if we, it scroll, is. if we go down um it's it's actually whoop, um let's see two is different I think she appears and, and we see I think it might too. be I think it might be the next page page 18 yeah. if you could scroll yeah. A little bit. yeah yeah because, yeah because yeah. she becomes she becomes Sue. Yeah. um so, but Sue on stage that second right, but see so it says Adelaide is literally singing the words of her own heart and and so I knew it would be Sue replacing Adelaide on stage but there still could have been a world that we could have done the um sound design that it could have been Haley's voice and, and instead of Ella's. And I mean, basically it's just, uh, you know, spoiled for choice because they both are extraordinary singers. And, um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, and I also, one of the things I knew I was so excited about was having our composers write an original song of the, uh, with the lyrics of Split the Lark. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but I mean, it really, it all, there, I guess what it is, is just like, there's so many choices beyond just like, like, like the, the script laid out a map and then it was building everything, even up to what I was describing of the like bird fluttering and that beautiful shot that, that Silas, our director designed of coming up and over Emily to discover Sue and, and this, and the way the sound design works with that. And then, um, you know, I, I guess we had also already, you know, in the script, this is this is designed this way, but that the the set of La Traviata 
sort of in this heightened way mirrors the parlor of the Evergreens and that Adelaide is wearing a gold dress like Sue's. And so Austin has already been seeing, everyone is seeing Sue in this woman already. Right. Um, and in the, in the, I, I guess Violetta as this courtesan, she represents, I mean, she's a, she's a Salonista, like she's a party girl and she's committed to her own pleasure um, beyond anything else, but she's also dying of tuberculosis and uh, is, you know, is ha like, I mean, they say, you know, it's like the oldest profession, like there's all these co connections between like actress and prostitute. And again, like these themes of what is real, um, you right. know. Right. Uh, yeah. um, okay, so we've got a couple of minutes. I think we should, um, unless anybody feels differently here, um, let's let's jump to page twenty four. Um, we've kind of we've kind of addressed um, Emily and Adelaide talking. Um, let's see where, where are we? Twenty four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and now we, you know, because she kind of has that deep sort of um, fantasy fantasy moment where she goes backstage and talks with Adelaide, which which ends, culminates with her um, kind of on stage looking out and seeing, um, you know, the theater packed with people and everyone's like standing and giving approval except for Sam. Right. Um, and I wondered um, if we could just kind of just talk about this page. Yeah, like Sam is the one person not you know, not uh, not approving of uh, of her universal appeal. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I guess another thing too that's happening in season two is, um, you know, se season two begins with Emily at the eye doctor, and that was a real thing. Emily had eye problems. She visited America's first ophthalmologist uh, in Cambridge, and. Mm -hmm. But he says to her, you know, you can't necessarily trust what you see. And she says to him, sometimes when I'm writing, you know, the, the, the edges of the page disappear. Like, I don't know what's real and what's the writing, you know. And we have Emily kind of becoming more isolated, more socially isolated, more internal and, um, and, and you know, in, in her own mind, which is compounded by the fact that the woman she loves more than anyone and the person who's always been her rock and her compass sue is actively lying to her all the time and and hiding the truth from her which makes emily even more disoriented about what's going on so um throughout season two we take a lot more risks with what's real and what's not and what's what's a what's What's a um, poem moment? What's a poetry experience and what's a real experience? But the thing that's interesting is that the emotion is the same regardless. So perhaps you could say that in the real story of this episode, um, the Dickinsons went to the opera, Emily saw Adelaide May sing, experienced a moment of transporting poetic ecstasy and connected with Sue and connected with the truth that what she really wants is love, not fame. And all of that happened in the same time and then they all went home together. Or perhaps there's a version where they went to the opera and she really did go backstage and she really did talk to Adelaide and they really did have this exchange. Um, little harder to explain how she got home after that one, but you know, um, <laughs> uh, the, 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 you know the, the thing is that like, we're very much in a in a liminal realm where what really matters is what's happening to Emily emotionally and psychically, um, which again kind of comes back to the fact that this is a show about a poet whose external life was pretty dull. Not a lot really happened to her. I mean, her trip to see Jenny Lynn sing, that's actually a big moment in wow. the Dickinson biography because she didn't leave home that much and she didn't do that much. Um, so, you know, I don't want to make a TV show that is actually only showing the external circumstances of Emily Dickinson's life because that would be a very boring show, in my opinion. Um, I want to make a show that can play in the spaces of the poems and that's what we're doing here with this. So in some ways, this is like a staging of the poem, Split the Lark. Yeah. Um, 
I think um, if we if we could t- take like like two more minutes, just like one one final wrap up question here. Um, if we go down to um, kind of uh, page twenty six and twenty six a, I think we just wanted to talk about there it is um, where the ushers like clear the stage, clear the stage this minute, or or I'll have to report you. And Emily quietly says, "You don't even know who I am." Yeah, I um, love that line. We we, we so, like. Um, but, do you remember? I love I love Haley's delivery of that line so much, and I love that when she was shooting her moment alone on the stage, she found herself the little sort of dancing that she does in that moment, and like I, it's just it's so beautiful, and it's like just one. She's such a genius performer. Um, I think that. For me, what is the meaning of this line is that Emily is beginning to discover the power of invisibility and the power of anonymity. And you have to remember that like, this is a show about the coming of age of Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. And how did she become Mm -hmm. the woman that she became, who was a person who eschewed most public contact. And this season starts to unpack that mystery or continues the unpacking of it. It presents a a set of ideas about perhaps why that might've been. Um, And, you know, look, I think you can see it as tragic because the fact is that it was a patriarchal society that um, branded women who sought fame as whores. Mm -hmm. That's what, Violetta is, that's what Adelaide is. That's how Emily is seen in the party episode right before this one as the scarlet letter, you know, ambition. Um, But, and, uh, but I suppose the thing is that within that context, she claimed agency by claiming the power of anonymity. And I think that, you know, this is not, just a historical analysis. This is a concern for everybody today who is like, should I be on social media? Should I have a personal brand? Right. You know, and is that gonna trap me? Um, And what do I get to keep for myself? You know, and I guess my, I guess I'm a little bit old fashioned in that I think that, you know, real poetry and real art is going to come from a private place and it's going to come from a place of truth and a place of, um, yeah, just you're, you're, you're alone and you're okay with that, you know, and, and you don't need to be known. It's, you don't even know who I am is a statement of power, you know, don't, don't give everything away. Wow. No. That's- well, on that note, <laughs> um, I I want to go rewatch this episode again immediately. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, but and for everyone else who's watching um, that wants to do that too, just know um, this uh, this panel we recorded it um, in the next couple of days. It will be up on the Writers Guild Foundation YouTube. Um, you can also read the script. Um, we'll also we'll let you know when that uh, when that's up on our website, and you can um, after. Um, after having watched this and, and gained all those insights, you can you can go and read it. Um, I certainly plan to. Um, and one final thing, um, if you're if you're sticking around, um, Javier and I um, will be back on Zoom literally in an hour. Um, we have our virtual um, virtual writing hours, our virtual library, um, and I'm gonna I'll link to that in the chat. Um, so if you want to stop by, if you have feedback for us about um, this series um you know stop by and let us know um but otherwise oh my god elena this is so good thank you you guys so much for having me and thank you everyone in the in the chat it's so nice of you to come and uh yeah i'm just so so happy to get to have this conversation focused on the script which is you know fun because i love i I love the script (laughs) you saw us all the time like Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for doing this. All right, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.